Why the combined intratumoral ablation and intratumoral immunotherapy approach? So they recognize that people are talking about ablation intratumorally. They're right. recognizing that people are focusing on immunotherapy, trying to deliver it better, so going to the tumor. Yeah. But they're going, why, why is the Williams Cancer Institute the only area that has thought about combining these together? So give us, give us some insight to your mindset sure. that kind of brought together this combination. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that you can look at it is, you know, an ablative technique to destroy cancer in an immune stimulating way is just another immunotherapy option. It's a way to kind of start, you know, start the fire going, right? And get get things going. Um, and clearly, you know, we, there's lots of ablation technologies and, you know, microwave, radio frequency. But those, those, I would relegate to old technologies that I don't really think we have a purpose for. I mean, I really don't ever use my, I, I have the systems, right? I don't use microwave. Uh, I don't use radio frequency ablation. Um, I do occasionally use cryoablation. Um, you know, I'd say pulse electric field certainly is now, you know, the more dominant technique. I think we feel comfortable that, you know, you're blading in a immune stimulating way more consistently than any other. So we kind of lean towards that, but, you know, and then you inject those drugs with that. So you're starting this process saying, okay, here's dead pieces of cancer. Here's these signals that you should attack it. And then we're going to further that with other pharmacological agents that are saying, hey, attack this. So we're just broadening that or, or you know, building off of that ablative uh, technology. Now, you know, the question is, can we do it without ablative technologies? And, you know, and, and we can. I mean, that, that is possible as well. I mean, there are things that you would say might function as like what we call lytic agents, you know, so agents that you can put in there. Um, yeah, I, I can think of several that we've worked with that are that are options. Um, and then sometimes once you get the process going, maybe you don't need to keep doing ablation, right? You, you know, you got it. You've got it going now. You can just like start injecting, injecting. And, and push that along. But I do think that a lot of times in the initial parts, if possible, doing pulse field ablation is very helpful. And I think that that's something that should be done when you can. Yeah, obviously there, there's synergy between the combination, but sometimes just because of maybe the organ involved, like the stomach, or yeah. there's some nearby vascularity, the right. ablation is not something that's amendable to safety or which we see quite regularly is there's peritoneal carcinomatosis and it's all a bunch of small nodules and so you can't really go into it to ablate and so you can kind of just if you will inject into the peritoneum right immunotherapy yeah so there's there's certainly there's cases that aren't really amendable to the ablative technologies and you you have you but you can go at it with immunotherapies alone right you, you don't have to have that but it's nice to have it when you can and uh, you know i think that it makes the process easier um but yeah there are certainly certain situations where you know it's it's not not possible or not or not warranted so you know we do it but certainly you want to get drugs in the tumors or close as close to the tumors as they can because you want that action to happen there you want the immune system to be attacking uh the cancer and so you want you know cancer immunotherapy drugs all to be in close proximity with immune cells coming there as well so putting them all in close proximity not just giving the drugs orally or intravenously now certainly there's certain situations that you may need to balance out that you might do systemically along with it but your primary focus particularly when you're talking about trying to get a heavy like t-cell insult or other very uh you know focused uh you know, those, these, these effector responses, as we would call them, you know, you want that at the tumor site. You don't want it all over the place. I mean, that's the, that's, you know, different. And, um, so yeah, you, that's why you have to put the therapies kind of where the tumor's at. <laughs> I mean, so. Yeah. Just, why more people haven't picked this up is, is beyond me, but yeah. there's a, there's a famous quote attributed, attributed to Mark Twain synergy the bonus that is achieved when things work together 
hormonal, hormonal, hormonally in a harmonious way. Yeah. Spit that out three times. But, you know, people think, well, one plus one, so ablation plus immunotherapy equals two. Yeah. But actually what we're really talking about here is one plus one equals 10 or even a hundred. And it's really, it's some insight to the innovation of ideas that you, that you really for, you know, brought to the forefront of really the medical arena, but it's also the idea that's gone into purpose and now into practice. But what's really interesting about the combination here, Jason, is that in the arena of cancer, where everything seems to be about escalation, this approach actually is more really about de-escalation when we're talking about the systemic doses, the systemic delivery. It's it's actually by going to the tumor and activating the immune system, it's really a process of de-escalation. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're putting you know, more drugs, lower doses, but in the tumor, you're getting a lot less as off target effects. I mean, you know, the thing is, is that uh, the effects are different depending on where the locations are, right? And so, you know, that's why you need to deliver the drugs in, in that area. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a key point. I mean, you really just can't treat cancer without trying to at least go directly at it. I mean, if you have sizable cancer to treat, I mean, now, you know, some patients have microscopic disease and stuff like that. Okay, it's a different story. But if you've got a targetable tumor, then you should be targeting it. <laughs> I, think, I think that's the standard. Um, and it should be the standard today. And I think it will be very soon. You yeah. know, so a lot of people would go, wait a second, I'm, I'm hearing you. But I thought we were winning this war on cancer. And that's, that's what's being uh, you know, perpetuated out there. But it's interesting when you look at, there's a 2021 um, a phase one study protocol that was published. They were talking about metastatic uh, prostate cancer, a pancreatic, duct, I mean, not prostate, but pancreatic ductal. And they said, there's no curative treatment option for patients with metastatic pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. And palliative chemotherapy regimens only moderately improve survival. Mm -hmm. Consequently, there is an urgent need for innovative and radically different treatment approaches. Yeah. That's 2021. How yeah. how long have you and the Williams Cancer Institute been doing this? Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I've been you know ablating and injecting in tumors for over 20 years at least. You know, I mean, in humans, yeah, and in mice even more. So you know, but uh, but but oh, yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, but but a long time. So you know, and 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 that's the thing that just seemed to make sense. I mean, you know we biopsy these tumors. So we're sticking a needle into it. Your biopsy is your first chance of treatment. You know, um, you know, people, you know, the argument will be like, well, oh, you don't know it's cancer until the pathology comes up. Oh, okay. Yeah, sort of. I mean, but I'll be honest with you. We can be about 90% sure. And we can inject some things that are okay. If it turns out it's not cancer, the patient's fortunate and it's not cancer wouldn't be harmful, but would still be beneficial, I mean, you know, or, or, you know, could be beneficial to other cancer patients, right? So, I mean, you could biopsy and you can inject Ketorlac, you could inject, you know, flu vaccine, you can inject vitamin C, you can inject ivermectin, you can do all these type of things like that. If, it, if they come back and say, hey, oh, that wasn't cancer. Oh, well, no big deal, really, right? You didn't, you didn't really cause any problems. And that's going to, I'll be honest with you, that's going to be the minority of patients because the majority of patients, it's cancer and we know it. And we know, we, we know these up front. I mean, we're just sort of fool, fooling ourselves. We're trying to make it, oh yeah, we're, we're going to biopsy because maybe this is not cancer. Yeah. Generally when we're doing biopsy, we know. And generally if I'm doing a biopsy of something that's not cancer, which happens, I mean, I would say that I'm like, oh, I, this is not going to be cancer. I know, but I'm going to biopsy it because they want us to biopsy it. We're going to go ahead and do it. And, uh, and, and, you know, in your breast cancer world, when you're audited by like the FDA and the stuff that, that, you know, regulates, they have the, uh, MQSA mam mam mammography quality standards act type of thing. You have to have certifications and all that. One of the things that they analyze, they take, take a look at your biopsies and if your biopsies are all 100% cancer, 
and you're not biopsying any benign disease they 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 ding they would ding you they would say that's not right you should be biopsying people that don't have cancer <laughs> so yeah, now i mean so so we do it <laughs> i mean kind of i mean and again you know people send a lot of you know uh fibroadenomas and things like that they're not cancerous you know and uh, and, and occasionally you'll get something that yeah it really looked like cancer and wasn't but that's rare but most of the time you know you know and so and, and that means that we know that we we should treat and you know we know that we should be doing more things in the future the biopsy will be the first start of treatment for patients and that's what it should be and hopefully we can we can change that that's, I mean that that idea right there alone is revolutionary because yeah. most people they get a biopsy and then you're looking depending on where you are in the world it yeah. could be weeks to months exactly before treatment is initiated mm -hmm. and it's a missed opportunity yeah yeah in the arena of cancer every missed opportunity well it's har harming these patients because you know now when you biopsied it and you inflamed it you've started a process and that's one of the things that they're showing of course is that the longer you wait for definitive treatment from the biopsy the more likely this cancer is going to have spread and that's because when you stick a needle in it you might inflame it in a way that may make it want to spread faster and so now you've started really a clock ticking on that so you got to really you know do something faster so that's why we shouldn't we shouldn't be sticking needles in these tumors without doing something to them and th and that really has the potential to massively change the approach to dcis in breast cancer i mean women all the time are getting mastectomies right yeah dcis but i mean this has the ability to to save breasts i mean yeah. think about it because if, if we look at this from a perspective of testicular cancer you know there would be an aggressive push to to save the testicles but for women it's like what take them off yeah yeah uh no you know and we shouldn't we shouldn't be operating on any of these patients anymore we should just you know identify the tumor treat it directly keep the patient intact and you know no matter what the stage early advanced all of it it should be um, immunologic because that's what's going to offer you the protection uh you know cutting it out um you know oh i mean Obviously, there's a situation, let's say, a person diagnosed with colon cancer and is obstructing. Okay, well, they're going to probably have to have surgery. There's, you know, certain situations where those things are warranted. But for the most part, if you're dealing with something that has not is not causing mass effect problems in the area and you can afford to then start injecting it, you could try to treat it and get rid of it that way and, and not have to go to these, you know, aggressive surgeries and, and maiming the patients and removing body parts. So let's go through uh, some of the mechanisms of, of why the synergy of the combination. And, and the first is tumor antigen release and exposure, whereby with the ablation, we're getting the release of the tumor associated antigens and the damage associated molecular patterns that you've talked about before. Yeah. But then the synergy with the immune system, optimizing the recognition, recognition and processing, yeah. well, what's that kind of magic cocktail, if you will? And I've actually seen it referenced in the literature as the antigen flood yeah well so then you know what's happening is you're getting those antigen getting those signals but then the cancer or the immune system or uh, in conjunction has the ability to shut those signals off say oh no those, those this is okay and so cancer obviously if it's there it's going to try to suppress that immune response uh by having the checkpoints and things like that so if you then if you simultaneously block those signals that are going to shut off the immune response down the road you keep that going and, and and propagate it then then also the others is that you have positive signals that you can send and say hey look i'm giving you these pieces and yet you you should attack it i'm this is this is like extra signal so so you cover your bases by having a mix of all of it so that you're you're you know you're giving the dead pieces you're giving the signal saying, okay here's the stuff this is what you should do all right, here's your stimulus. Yes, you should really attack it. Oh, and then the things that want to shut it down, oh, we're going to block those too. <laughs> so, I mean, it, and it's novel and it makes perfect sense to us, but, you know, the more we talk about it and clearly, you know, there's lots of uh, approaches to get this information out there, uh, both in an educational standpoint, but also in a scientific standpoint. And I think that's going to be what really continues to elevate. But one of the things also too is, 
patients say, well, I thought when you give therapeutics IV, all of it's reaching the tumor. So one of it is, so the second point here is modulation of the tumor microenvironment. Yeah. And I think a lot of people fail to recognize the really dense matrix that, that exists and also immune signaling that exists to actually buffer and keep systemic immunotherapy out. But the intratumoral ablation technique obviously disrupts that barrier. Yeah. And also the intratumoral immunotherapy allows you to deliver it right to, so you're able to completely bypass that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, again, it's like, hey, you want, you want to get it there to the site. I mean, like, it's like, for example, you got this fires over in Los Angeles. And we could, we could start infusing some water from New York. Eventually it will get there. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> that's great. That's a great, that's great. I don't know. It may not. Well, it take a long time. It take a lot of it, right? That's the problem. It takes a long time and a lot of it. The drugs are the same way. It takes a long time, a lot of it, a lot more drug, a lot more side effects, a lot more problems. And so, you know, that's that's the, the issue when you're giving this thing far away, expecting it to get to the tumor. It's, you know, it's not very much that's going to do that. And uh, you're going to have to give so much, you're going to have toxicity issues. And that limits a lot of your uses of drugs. There's a lot of drugs that are good. They're like, hey, they're like, oh, this drug, oh, it, it kills cancer. It does great. Oh, let's give it. No, it was toxic. Yeah, because you got to give so much. But when you're putting in a tumor, that's not the case. So then to, to use your analogy there, so the, the water coming from New York uh, to L.A., I think that's great because then people go, well, what's the what's the comparison or the analogy to the direct? Well, I think it's the planes dipping down yeah. in the Pacific Ocean, gathering up, right on it going on and dropping it right on it exactly yeah i mean yeah that's you got you got to target it directly i mean it's the thing so um yeah it, there, it limits so all this attack here directly it limits all the limitations it really completely bypasses almost the pharmacokinetics of the liberation absorption distribution metabolism yeah. excretion and so all of those limiting factors of when people think take things orally or iv we we don't need to worry about them yeah yeah exactly and, and so so much so much safer just it's just it's just better all around you know and so that's why like at least you've got to incorporate that now you know i, I i've obviously we've been trying to, to get people to change this and, and push it and i understand still you know the systemic therapies are very embedded and ingrained in, in the system and that's what's covered by insurance and you know that we're, we're having to kind of deal with that so you know from my standpoint you know i've come up with sort of what i would consider would be the you know the compromise and say hey look do your systemic stuff just keep it but then let us inject yeah let's make it better i mean let's just let's improve it you keep doing your stuff hopefully then we're going to be able to get you off of that you're going to hopefully you have to use less of it and we're going to make that better but keep doing what you're doing. Look, you're seeing your oncologist. They want to give you that. Give, let them do it. We'll jump on top of it, and we'll and we'll make it better. And and that way, we're not offending them. Well, hopefully, we're not offending the oncologist. Now, it's funny if the oncologist say, "Oh no," but well, you know, I'm not going to give you therapy if they're doing this stuff because that makes no sense. But um, but none nonetheless, you know, the oncologist is still doing their thing, and then we're slowly changing the system where we're not saying we're not coming and say eliminate, eliminate all that and now change this. Let's have the transition. And yeah, um, we're building a bridge. We're building yeah. a bridge. It's it it's ultimately about the patient and the outcome of the patient and the quality of life as they achieve that outcome. Mm -hmm. And it's really about partnering together and collaborating together to honestly make what the conventional oncologist has to do less negative and and really help the patient more yeah yeah exactly so how so the immune system gets activated because a lot of people think well we're destroying the entirety of the tumor but really what we're doing is we're destroying part of the tumor because we need these antigen presenting cells to be recruited and activated within the environment to then activate the t-cells